Whether it's ancient combat or modern sport, winning is what it's all about. But how do you win? This man has learned the hard way. Now, he's ready to show you. The newest form of personal combat is less than a century old. Pilot versus pilot, each in his own aircraft, hundreds or even thousands of feet above the ground. Ever since the first Knights of the Air took to the skies in World War I, the basics have remained the same. How is that possible? Jets flying at twice the speed of sound with laser-guided missiles. Compared with aircraft made of wood and canvas with a top speed of little more than 100 miles an hour. One thing remains the same, the pilot and his level of skill and aggression in flying his aircraft. This is a fighter pilot school. How to win at air combat. The Wright brothers made the first powered flight on December the 17th, 1903. Here's a model of their aircraft, the Flyer One. Just 11 years later, World War I broke out and the aircraft went to war. Since there had never been any air warriors before, pilots at this time had to make up the rules as they went along, including the dress rules. Many of them were cavalry officers, so they chose riding boots and breeches, then several layers of woolen shirts and sweaters, a leather trench coat, scarves, goggles, and a flying hat. As for the aircraft themselves, for many years, the most popular type was this, the biplane. At the beginning of the First World War, most had two seats for the pilot and the observer. They weren't even fitted with guns. They were designed solely for reconnaissance. Then they started shooting at each other. In two-seaters, while the pilot flew, his observer would lean out and fire with a pistol or rifle when enemy aircraft came alongside. Of course, he had a better shot if he could point his gun forward. But that meant standing up, perhaps firing over the wing, and trusting his pilot not to make any sudden maneuvers. The first advance was to put a machine gun at the rear, firing backwards or sideways. But even better was to mount that same weapon pointing forward. It didn't take long for inventors to design machine guns with synchronizers, mechanical devices that shut off the bullets as the propeller passed in front. Now a single pilot could do it all. Fly, aim, and fire. The true single-seat fighter was born. In 1915, aircraft with this technology swept the skies. Since the first combat aircraft, instructors have used models to teach pilots how to win. The first problem is aiming and judging the distance to the target. The earliest gun sight was the ring and the bead. Now, every pilot was taught the exact wingspan of his opponent's aircraft. So, if you filled this ring with his wingspan, you knew exactly how far away he was. But it's not as easy as that. The target was very rarely directly in front, or directly below. Most attacks are at an angle off the tail, which makes estimating the range very difficult. And of course, the target was moving, trying desperately to get away from you. Experience, judgment, and practice were vital. To be sure of a kill, you have to get in very close. That aircraft over there is out of range. Here's the problem. The moment you fire your bullets, they start to fall. If you're too far away, you'll never hit the target. So, how close do you have to be? No more than 50 to 100 yards away. At this distance, bullets fall no more than a few inches. And if you aim straight, you'll get a hit. It doesn't matter if you're flying a biplane, a single-winged prop plane, or jet fighter. These fundamental skills of air combat still hold true today. In fact, modern jet pilots still learn the basics in prop planes like this one. Now it's time to experience it for myself, to try some of these techniques for real. I'm at a school where they teach people like me how to fly aircraft in air combat. Hi, guys. 
One of these pilots is Mike Blackstone. He's already taught me some of the basics of flying. Peter Woodward. Hi, Mike. Good to see you again. I'd like you to meet my partner in crime, Jim Newbauer, call sign Nails. Mike nice and Nails you. will take me through the lessons I need to prepare for my own dogfight, beginning with respect for the hardware. And now, uh, don't do that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Inside. We will be flying the Italian-built Marchetti, a propeller plane designed for military use with flight characteristics similar to a jet. The instructor maintains safety control in the right-hand seat, but I will actually be flying the aircraft from the left, with its weapons at my command. Ultra-miniature cameras mounted in strategic positions provide views of our lessons. It's a far cry from a television studio, but it does the job. All I need is two minutes up here, seeing another plane in my path, to see why the pilots of World War I wanted their machine guns right in front of them. Putting a weapon on the nose of the aircraft made it into a very effective gun platform. All the pilot has to do is point in the right direction and fire. Seems obvious to us now, but it was a real breakthrough. It has always been up to each individual pilot to exploit the advantages of his aircraft. Each plane, for instance, has an absolute limit above which it cannot fly. This is called the ceiling, and as I climb to reach it, my plane slows down. But I am learning that this is where I look for an edge over the enemy. Now, it's possible that my opponent can't fly this high, so he can't jump me, but I can look down on him and see him below me, and then dive down to attack him. Immediately as I dive, gravity helps me down. We go faster and faster. Now, the first pilot to use these basic techniques was a German air ace called Max Immelmann. Excuse me while I pull out of this dive. Oh! Rather than just follow his target, Max Immelmann realized he could use the forces of gravity. He developed the Immelmann turn, one of the earliest air combat maneuvers. He would dive down on his target, fire a short burst, then use his speed to zoom upwards. Now he was losing speed, nearly stalling the aircraft. He would kick the rudder hard over, and the aircraft would fall out of the sky. If his target had changed direction, that was OK. He would simply steer towards him, dive down, fire another burst, and then zoom upwards once again. He kept on doing this until he'd shot his enemy out of the sky. Another great German pilot, Oswald Bolker, created a list of basic rules for air fighting called the Dicta Bolker. Nearly a century old, aviators are still taught to follow them today, and I am learning them as well. Number one, get into the best position, usually above and behind the target. Two, get between the sun and your target, so that when he looks for you, he is blinded by the sun. Three, don't fire until he is within range and in your sights. Four, attack when the enemy is not expecting it. For instance, when he is preoccupied with observing below him. Five, keep your eye on him and never lose sight of him. The sixth rule is to avoid foolish acts of bravery, to live to fight another day. But the most important rule of all is that when attacked, you never turn your back. Air combat is extremely aggressive. Defensive maneuvers are only any good if they get you in a position to fire back. But what happens when I suddenly realize that I have an enemy aircraft on my tail? Peter, we've got an enemy fighter on our tail. In the air, with instructor Mike Blackstone beside me, I am surprised by another aircraft on our tail. Where is he? Directly behind us. I see him. Right on our tail. My plane is in his gun sight, and once he has me there, I cannot shake him. I roll, I dive, I break, but he stays with me and finally takes his shot. A marker plume of smoke signals that I am hit. It's all over in seconds. Like so many novice pilots, I am shot down in my first dogfight. Now it's time to learn how to keep it from happening again. 
If attacked, you have four choices. The first is the climb. Now, this is useless. All a climb does is slow you down. You may end up above your opponent, but he'll still have a clear shot at you. The second choice is the dive, but a controlled dive is easy for your opponent to follow. The next choice is the roll. Combined with the dive, this can really get you out of trouble. The best choice is the break, a hard turn towards the attacking aircraft. These basics, in use since World War I, took on new dimensions when the next war came around. And my next stop is a place where the aircraft of World War II are preserved. We're at Cal Aero Field, the Plains of Fame Air Museum at Chino in California. We've come here to look at their remarkable collection, also to see how by the time of World War II, fighter aircraft had made great advances. For a start, they were much faster than before, which meant a higher closing speed. But it also meant that you had less time actually firing at the target. Also, some parts of the aircraft were now protected with armor, especially the back of the pilot's seat. And the number of guns was increased, up to eight machine guns. Also, they were of increasingly heavy caliber. The heaviest of all was the cannon. This fired small explosive shells, a much slower rate of fire, but much more effective. Despite the improvements in technology, it was always down to the pilot's experience and guts. Guts, because he still had to get in really close to be sure of victory. As the aircraft improved, so did the techniques of air combat. What was it like to win with these machines in battle? The best way to learn today is in a flight simulator. This one is in Irvine, California, and my instructor is Curtis Platt. As, uh, air traffic controllers. The control tower for the simulator system is a row of computers. Curtis picks me two classic aircraft from World War II, the American F-4F Wildcat and its nemesis, the deadly Japanese Zero. This is a Wildcat, the primary US Navy fighter at the outbreak of the Pacific War. It could fly high and it could take a lot of punishment. But this is a Japanese Zero. Now, this baby could outclimb, outturn, outpace, and outrange any Allied fighter of the time. But even the Zero had weaknesses. To keep it light, it had no armor. So, if you could get a shot at the Zero, it was really vulnerable. Taking off in the simulator, I'm suddenly over the Pacific Ocean ready to practice the moves that I'll need when I encounter the enemy. All right, now I'm at straight and level flight. I'm going to try a barrel roll. Here it is. The Wildcats weren't as fast or agile as the Zeros, but a good pilot could use rolls and maneuvers to try and gain an advantage. There's another maneuver I want to try called the split S. This is how I quickly reverse direction to turn the tables on any zero that might be chasing me. A split S works like this. First, I roll my plane 180 degrees so that I'm completely belly up. Then I point the nose straight down. A moment later, I pull out of the dive and my plane is going in the opposite direction. My flight path looks like the bottom of the letter S, a split S. This is great for improving marksmanship and basic tactical techniques. The problem is that I'm now throwing this thing around with ease, and of course it's not really like that. The one thing the simulator can't show you is the physical effects of air combat on the pilot. The average World War II aircraft had to fly at least 80 miles an hour, any slower than that, and it would stall and fall out of the sky. But as the angle of bank increases, I have to go faster in order to stay up. At 60 degrees, I need to be going 115 miles an hour. But at 80 degrees bank, I need at least 200 miles an hour. And in air combat, I would be flying as fast as I possibly could. How does all that banking and turning affect the pilot? Well, it subjects him to punishing G-forces that can be dangerous and even deadly. Now, let you into a little secret. At normal gravity, G1, I weigh about 175 pounds. But if I take this aircraft into a 60-degree banking turn, here I go. At about 60 degrees, 
I am now at G2, twice gravity, which means that I now weigh 350 pounds. But if I increase the bank to 75 degrees, I'm now at G4, and I weigh 700 pounds. And, and G4 is about the limit at which you can really fight or shoot accurately. And G6, you would certainly black out. So before I do that, I'm going to oh, come out of it again. Now it's time for me to experience the incredibly realistic illusion of fighting a pair of Japanese Zeros above the island chains of the far Pacific. Since I can't physically look around me in three dimensions, the simulator gives me a little pointer in the center to show me where the enemy is. Each Zero in the distance is tagged on my screen with a red identifier. When I get close enough, I'll see the image of the plane itself. But the danger is that someone might creep up behind me while I'm concentrating on this guy. The ideal position for attacking a plane is from behind and above, preferably with the sun behind you. Now, I'm behind him and I'm shooting at him, and I've got him. OK. Now, I've got the first one. The problem is I don't know where the second one is. There he is, and I'm going to dive down on him. So I've got to stay behind him and shoot when I can. And he's diving around the place. Where's he gone? He's there, he's sticking close to the ground. The reality of this is quite extraordinary. Here I am. Oh, I'm pretty close to the ground here, and I've crashed. <sighs> no one ever said air combat was easy. Back at air combat school, I have a few questions before my real dogfight. How do I know that I've shot another aircraft down? The only thing actually simulated is the bullets. Everything else is real. And you'll have in your right hand, you'll have a stick grip off of an F4, and you'll pull the trigger just like an F4 pilot would be pulling the trigger shooting guns. There'll be no question in your mind when you get a kill. Now, Nails will be the instructor in the plane I'll fly against, but I have yet to meet the pilot who will be my actual opponent. Peter, I'd like you to meet your adversary, Smudge. Call sign Smudge and Larry Vidal. Peter. Gentlemen, this is the real deal. This is air combat. There's no points for second place. So, now the gloves are off. My opponent and I are in the briefing room, where Mike talks us through the battle we are about to fight. Let's get to the shooting part. That's why you guys are here. You guys are here, are here because you want to, want to kill each other, basically, right? In order to kill another airplane, you need to get into a firing parameter to that, that can achieve that. Your best chances for landing bullets on another airplane are from a rear quarter. In other words, a rear... Wait a minute. A rear I know this. It's exactly what I learned from studying the aces of World War I. The distance you need to be to shoot is between 500 feet and 1,000 feet. And to tell that distance, we use our gun sight. Our gun sight allows us to measure the size of our opponent's airplane. I know this too. The old ring and bead. The basic idea hasn't changed in nearly 90 years. Then you squeeze the trigger down, you hold it down for three to five seconds, and whammo. You get a shot, you get a kill, the smoke comes on, and you know that you've done your job well. What has changed is the performance of the aircraft. We'll be turning in tight circles, constantly forcing us to look out of the top of our canopies to keep our eyes in the direction we're turning. Our two planes are evenly matched, so the pilot who turns most efficiently is the one who will get in firing position first and win. If you can keep your head together while you're fighting, you're going to do well. If you start losing it, letting emotions take over, you're going to lose. Off to the planes now, and we'll really see who the better man is. This is it. The time has come. I'm now in the air, flying formation. I'm about to have a dogfight with the plane beside me. And it begins like this. Making contact by radio, we agree to start by heading directly toward each other. Bring it up. Bring it up. Sit, he comes out of the sun very fast, and I'm suddenly aware how small the target is in a very big sky. In fact, I need to slow this down just to show it to you. Do you see him there? Now, I'm going to break left and drop down on him, building up speed as I dive. I try to get behind him, but he's trying to do the same thing and escapes. We turn into each other again, but I decide to pull up to get above him.
I roll the aircraft upside down so that when I look up, I am looking down at the ocean. At four and a half Gs, my body is screaming at me. I can hardly hold the stick, and Mike is urging me to hang in. But I'm disoriented. Where am I? And where is he? But wait, there he is. I'm right on top of him. This is what we call a snapshot, as he passes directly through my gun sight for only an instant. I fire ahead of him, and he flies straight into my bullets. The plume of smoke tells me I have hit him, but I fire again to make sure he goes down. I spray him repeatedly, and he rolls out in defeat. I don't know where my stomach is anymore. <laughs> the exhilarating experience is coming to an end. As we were told, only the bullets were simulated, so both planes are returning to base unharmed. For me, I'm glad to say I was able to apply the lessons I learned. Despite the torture to my body, I remembered to be aggressive, to approach my target from the rear, to get him in my gun sights and fire. I had no choice. Success in this fight was up to me alone. So, how do you win at air combat? Well, it doesn't matter whether you fly a biplane or a jet fighter. What matters is not the plane, but the pilot.